<clears throat> okay, good evening, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm recording this lesson for the benefit of uh, allowing you to study it in your own free time, especially during this week, which is actually supposed to be dedicated for summative assessment, but nevertheless, uh, to give you more time to focus on the summative assessments on your other subjects, since we won't have any summative assessment for this week. Uh, this will be our, our activity for this week is asynchronous. And thus, uh, the video was prepared for this very purpose. Our learning objectives for this module is to re reanimate our knowledge of the ecosystem. I know that you already know some basic concepts in ecology, so it's like recalling or reviewing this lesson and uh, study its components in the different processes that contributes to homeostasis or balance of nature and apply the environmental principle that everything is connected to everything else and understand the relationship between humans and the environment in order to enhance the environmental stewardship and sustainability. For the topic outline, we're going to discuss or describe an ecosystem and what the components of an ecosystem is or are, and these are namely the abiotic and biotic components, and together with this, the different kinds of interactions that happen in the ecosystem. And in addition to that would be the ecosystem processes such as the food chain, food webs, trophic levels, biomass, and biomes. In, in nature, the levels of organization, because we're, we're studying interactions, the level of organization actually starts at the level of the individual organism. Unlike when we're studying the human body, uh, it starts actually to the smallest level, which is atoms, and we go on higher. But in nature, it begins with the individual. And uh, when individuals group together, they collectively form a unit called a population. When populations uh, group together, they do not comprise a community, which is the next level, unless there is the, um, it, uh, there should, population meaning to say what I mean, well, what I meant was when several populations interact with each other, it doesn't necessarily require that the population would be of similar of the same species. And uh, instead, it uh, would involve different uh, populations of different species, like what the picture sh shows. No? There's a population of fish, uh, plants, uh, young jellyfish, uh, and uh, such diverse interactions of various populations comprises a community. If you go in further in the ecosystem level, this now would include the abiotic component or the non-living component of the ecosystem. So aside from the various populations that mingle with each other, they, their existence would not have been possible without the inclusion of the non-living components because this is where most of the nutrients would be derived. Then higher than the ecosystem would be the biomes. And biomes similar are similar. There are certain similarities between ecosystem and biomes because of the uh, typical uh, features that would be found in an ecosystem, and it can also be found in a biome. However, when we speak of biomes, it involves a large geographical area on Earth, 
No, we're talking about the earth. And we're not talking about just a small place in Dasmarinas. Kasi when we when in in terms of uh, the scale of how big or small an ecosystem is compared to the scale of how big a biome is, an ecosystem can be as small as a community under a rock. Uh, let's say you you found a rock on your garden and you pick up the rock, you notice that there are some living things, different kinds of living things underneath the rock. That alone constitutes an ecosystem because it allows the survival of the different living things there despite that limited space. And an ecosystem can also be big, such as when we're talking about marine ecosystem or uh, tropical rainforests. However, for a biome, a biome, I could probably say that it's an ecosystem on a uh, gigantic scale. So more, more uh, closely on a geographical scale, meaning to say, if you get a map of the world, you can actually outline how big this ecosystem is. And if it is on the scale on the map, it is typically described as a biome. Okay? So malaking ecosystem yun pag biome. And altogether, if we combine all of this together, it will collectively form the biosphere. The biosphere is only a small portion of the earth. It's actually found on the surface of the earth and it does not extend deeper than the mantle. Nandun lang, uh, than, than the pinaka, ano niya, di ba, yung pinaka earth's crust. Na. In fact, it does not even go too deep beneath the earth's crust. Uh, to the point of reaching the mantle. Nasa ibabaw lang talaga yung biosphere. And yung extent niya naman sa taas would only reach as far as the troposphere because higher than the troposphere, uh, the amount of oxygen will no longer be enough to sustain life. So to define an ecosystem, an ecosystem is a community of living organisms in conjunction with the non-living components of the environment interacting as a system. And they comprise uh, biotic and abiotic components, meaning to say living thing and non-living things that are linked together through different processes such as nutrient flows, and energy flows. And ecosystems are controlled by external and internal factor. The picture that you see on the left, typically also, it's a, it's a typical representation also of the levels of organization by which uh, the ecosystem encompasses everything within its boundaries. Uh, In creating a schematic diagram, we can clearly show that the ecosystem has two major components, namely the abiotic and the biotic factors. And the non-living abiotic factors are, would, are also are further divided into climatic factors, those that influences the weather, such as rain, temperature, light, and wind while the edaphic factors are those that are found on the surface of the planet. And this include the soil, pH, minerals, and even the topography or the contour of the surface constitute an, abi an abiotic factor. The biotic factors, on the other hand, uh, includes are divided into three groups, namely the producers, consumers, and decomposers. And uh, producers are those that are capable of photosynthesis. And uh, this generally comprises the green plants. 
we refer to them as the autotrophs, meaning to say they are capable of producing food for themselves, unlike the other biotic factors which survives on feeding other feeding on other organisms. Consumers, second, uh, are actually a diverse group of living things and uh, they differ from one another based on the level by which their consumption relies on um, on a source of food lower than uh, their trophic level. They are also referred to as the heterotrophs. We need to say uh, the food are derived from different sources other than uh, because they cannot produce the food on their own. <clears throat> uh, okay, and uh, as I said, these consumers are categorized based on the level by which they consume the food you know, in the trophic level, such as we have the primary consumers, and these primary consumers actually feed on the producers, and following that, what feeds on them are the secondary, and what feeds on the secondary are the tertiary, and what feeds on the tertiary are the quaternary, and so forth. The third group of living things are the decomposers. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this would constitute the bacteria and fungi and saprotrophs, those that feed, feed on dead matter. So meaning to say nothing in nature goes to waste because even dead organisms or dead uh, plants or animals become food for these decomposers. Uh, another a good uh, graphic representation show is shown here on the screen uh, between the biotic factors and the uh, biotic factors. Uh, so the biotic factors are the fungi, plants, proteins, animals, archaea. Archaea are organisms where they thrive on extreme conditions and bacteria. Whereas for the abiotic factors, so they Obviously, those are non-living components that constitute air as well as the features of the earth, uh, salinity, soil, temperature, light, water, minerals, pH, and humidity. Okay, in the abiotic factors, they are the the important role of the each abiotic factors are shown here. For temperature, it allows plants to grow best in moderate temperatures, while sunlight is used by plants to make food. Soil serves as the medium by which uh, plants uh, take on or uh, grows on and water is also an essential component that allows them to that, that where they use it to grow air provides oxygen but uh, for plants uh, it is carbon dioxide that they take in while they produce oxygen for the uh, animals uh, and climate because since the earth has different climates, it uh, also influences the type of organism that would thrive on a specific uh, area with a specific climatic condition. Biotic factors, as shown here, rely on abiotic factors to live. So there's a mutual, there's actually a mutual relationship between biotic and abiotic factors. Uh, because biotic factors, well, they completely rely on abiotic factors to survive. And uh, the abiotic factors, on the other hand, uh, 
is enabled to move through the different spheres of the earth by means of the activities influenced by the biotic factors. So, so ito yung mga cycles, natural cycles that uh, allows the movement of these abiotic factors and it happens because uh, of the influence or the activities done by the biotic factors. <clears throat> One important concept that you have to understand about uh, ecosystem or how uh, living things are regulated with regards to the population are called limiting factors. Limiting factors are factors in the environment that can prevent population from attaining their biotic potential. Meaning to say, if an organism has the opportunity to acquire all the necessary things or food or any essential resource that it can use in order to reproduce and perpetuate its kind, it will do so. So, talagang ideally, uh, ito yung tinatawag natin biotic potential. You need to say they can reproduce as many as they can, provided that they have the, all the necessary things in order to, to survive. However, there are factors in the environment that prevent them from multiplying too much. Uh, otherwise, <clears throat> if they multiply without any obstacle at all, they would probably overrun the earth. Okay? So what prevents them from happening are the limiting factors. So in this table, there are two columns where uh, the limiting, the, the first column would be the limiting factors that cause the population to increase and the limit and the factors that cause a population to decrease. Yung second column, are the refers to the limiting factors kasi sila yung talagang magre-regulate eh. so ang biotic potential naman refers to the first column meaning to say if everything all conditions are ideal for them dadami sila so ano yung mga factors that uh, help them attain their biotic potential favorable light di ba ito a biotic to favorable temperature favorable chemical environment. So if it if you apply it to us humans, diba kung, kung may light, why is it that it is favorable when there is favorable light for us, the population of humans tend to increase? It's because it allows more plants to grow that people can feed on. Diba? And it also applies to other animals. Okay, so sa biotic naman, if there is sufficient food or prey that we can capture and eat, low number of effectiveness of predators, kulang ang predators sa paligid, few or weak diseases and parasite, which, meaning, which means that our immune system is strong, and the ability to compete for resources. So as they say, di ba? Uh, survival of the fetus allows one to perpetuate itself. Those factors that limits the population would either be too much or too little light. Pag masyadong matingkad ang araw, chances are it would probably be a desert. Or pag too little light, it becomes too cold. In a desert, it becomes too warm. <clears throat> and thus, it creates unfavorable chemical environment. So the biotic uh, limiting factors, on the other hand, would be insufficient food, high number of high effectiveness of predators, the diseases are very virulent, and parasites are very uh, aggressive, and the inability to compete successfully for resources. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, the next one are ecosystem interactions. How do this uh, interaction take place? Uh, we are actually referring to interactions that happen in the biotic uh, component. Uh, ito yung kung paano sila mag-mingle, no? mag-interact sa isa, isa't isa. So, hindi pinapakita dito yung uh, abiotic because the abiotic would uh, constitute a different uh, topic no? and this would include yung mga nutrient flows, nutrient cycles, and energy flows. So, let's focus our attention on the biotic interactions. In this uh, flow chart, it shows that uh, ecosystem interactions, particularly the bio biotic interactions, include symbiosis. So symbiosis is where um, it allows the survival of two different uh, biotic components despite uh, one getting the most of the interaction and the other one somehow is deprived. And the common symbiotic uh, relationship or interactions would be parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. We will discuss it further later. While another biotic interaction would be competition, between uh, species as well as feeding. So meaning to say, there is the predator-prey relationship. Uh, yung competition naman, on the other hand, does not necessarily mean uh, it involves two uh, organisms of the same species because there is also a competition between a species, one species, and an entirely different species. So for example, if we would be cutting the trees to uh, establish a subdivision or construct a subdivision in a habitat that is uh, originally occupied by tigers, uh, that means there is now a competition for space. Unfortunately, it's the tiger that loses the competition, but not after it has eaten some of the humans living in the community. <clears throat> interactions may be positive, and there are also negative interactions. When the interaction is positive, that means the parties involved are benefit from the relationship and examples of these positive interactions are mutualism, commensalism, and proto-cooperation. Negative interactions on the other hand would benefit one species while the one it interacts with is deprived or ultimately is, is sacrificed or killed in the process. And this includes amensalism, parasitism, predation, cannibalism, and competition. So earlier, what we have discussed earlier are called interspecific interactions, meaning to say um, it involves two different species interacting with each other. But within the species itself, for example, uh, species ng humans, uh, human species, or let's say dog species, or yung species ng uh, mga bears, di ba? They also interact among themselves. And these are the different kinds of interactions. Uh, there is reproduction. So that means... Uh, in order to reproduce, there is a process for selection and location, and location of mate. Minsan, pag uh, solitary ang isang animal, it has to travel for miles around just to find its mate. 
And the location and attraction may occur by advertisement using scent. Nakaamoy niya. Sound or sight. And because of the limited number of mates that can be found, it results in the competition for the mate. Sa nagpapatayan sila. Na? And winner takes all. Whoever wins, it takes all. The loser has to fall. Okay, there is also a degree, varying degrees of care for offsprings. There are many species for in after uh, they have copulated. Diba? It's the female who rears the offspring on their own, but there are also some species wherein there is a there is a family unit. Na? The both parents are present to care for the offsprings. There are also species wherein after being born, they are left by the parents to tend on their own and therefore the the siblings, yung mga magkakapatid, are the ones that actually take care of themselves. And there are also colonies wherein they tend to group together uh, following the concept that there is strength in numbers. Uh, Species also within, uh, uh, organism within the same species also uh, exhibit altruistic social behavior, meaning to say they tend to help each other. Let's say, uh, di ba yung mga wild dogs, they form a pack when finding food and they create strategies to attack a potential prey <clears throat> or capture a potential prey. And they also have a system of defending their territory. It says sa uh, mga bees, no? they have a system of cleaning hives and also caring for the young. And uh, competition also happens within the same species for food, space, light, water, nutrients, and shelter. And there, is, uh, there are different effects that happen when the population begins to increase. Una una, there are certain events that depend that happens depending on the density. For example, if the population is becoming too big, a density dependent factor emerges, such as diseases. Masyado na kasi siksikan, nagkakasakit na. And that's one of the factors that decreases or reduces the population. Or there is a tendency for them to disperse. Masyado na silang madami. So I think it's time that they spread out to look for uh, different habitats because the original habitat is no longer big for, let's say, a large population. Okay. And now comes the ter territoriality, especially if the geographic space is very small. And thus... Uh, some species tend to become territorial. So self thinning also is happens because of this competition. In this particular table, you will see the different interactions, no? interspecific interactions, the nature of their interactions and whether this interaction would be uh, beneficial to one species, meaning to say it will be indicated with a positive sign or if would, it would be detrimental to another species as shown by a negative sign. Okay, so for example, sa neutralism, pag zero naman ang naka-indicate, that means there, they, there is actually not nothing happens to both of them so neither population is affected while sa number two yung mutual inhibition pag sinabing inhibition napipigilan and there is direct inhibition of each species by the other such as negative yung species one pati species two so let's look at a more familiar interaction yung 
amensalism, number four. Diba? Sa amensalism, yung species one is negative, while the other species zero is, does, is not affected. That means one of the population is inhibited while the other is not affected. Kumbaga, na, 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 na agrabyado yung species 1 dahil sa species 2, pero yung species 2 wala namang nangyayari sa kanya. Hindi din siya nakikinabang sa species 1. Parasitism, on the other hand, species 1, which is positive, benefits from species 2, which is the victim. Uh, siya, yung, siya yung host while species 1 is the parasite. Okay, so just look through this interaction and use your imagination. Try to remember what are the different kinds of species that... Uh, is represented by each type of interspecific interactions. And you have to find them out because in our uh, assessments, in our enabling and summative assessments, there will be some questions wherein you have to identify what kind of interspecific interactions is exhibited by this kind by the relationship of these two species or two different species. <clears throat> okay, so another, an, an, the next lesson on interconnectedness is uh, the food chain and the food web. Okay, the, the diagram showed here on the upper right. Paano ko ba ituturo? Diyan, dito, sa upper right na to, is a food chain while on this portion is the food web. Okay. So, food chain is a series. It's a series of events or probably a series of food <laughs> that begins from the very uh, producer and ends up with probably the final predator. So, example natin, yung nasa gitna, na yung carrots that will be eaten by the rabbit and the rabbit that will be eaten by the fox and the fox that will be eaten by the lion. Whereas sa uh, food web naman, it becomes more complex because uh, technically speaking, a food web comprises different food chains interlink with one another. Diba? Mga, kumbaga, uh, we can actually extract one uh, food chain from a food web. Okay. So, why is it, why is a food web complex? Because there is the possibility that one species may eat several species down the line. Diba? Hindi lang siya nagtatribe sa isang klase ng pagkain. Tulad nga ng kasabihan nila, di ba? Sa Bible, man does not live on bread alone. Napakalungkot naman kasi ng buhay kung gano'n ang ating, <laughs> kung gano'n ang ating means of survival, no? Tinapay lang. So, the reason why uh, it's good to be living is because we get the opportunity to experience different kinds of food. Uh, and that is why we have the food web. <clears throat> I hope that you have downloaded uh, and read the story on the return of the wolf on in Yellowstone National Park. That's a very interesting story of interconnectedness. Wherein, if we remove one important species in the ecosystem, boom, babagsak yung ecosystem. No? The ecosystem collapses as uh, demonstrated in this real-life event no, involving the wolves of Yellowstone. So, the wolves of Yellowstone are considered to be keystone species. Ang keystone kasi... It's a it's an engineer it's an engineering term meaning to say if you have a building that is made up of blocks stacked together 
Okay, there is one particular stone in that building or block that if you remove the entire building collapses. And that particular block is the keystone. So ganun ang tu tu turing nila sa um, wolves. Okay, and when the wolves were removed, the ecosystem of Yellowstone National Park ultimately collapsed. On the other hand, there are what we call charismatic species. Charismatic species somehow uh, attracts the, the sympathy. It attracts the sympathy of the general public such that if you use this charismatic species uh, to launch a conservation program, that charismatic species is their mascot or the symbol of the conservation of a particular area. So these are large animal species with symbolic value or widespread popular appeal and are often used by environmental activists to achieve environmentalist goal. Like yung mga, um, di ba sa, in the, in the, in World Wildlife Fund, you see that the charismatic species in World Wildlife Fund is the bear or the polar bear. Okay, so that is their symbol because the polar bear is a, an endangered species that needs to be protected. And in so doing, uh, it's a symbol. It's a symbol for curving the effects of climate change. And we can also think of other kinds of charismatic species. A flagship species, on the other hand, is a species selected to act as an ambassador, icon, or symbol for a defined habitat issue campaign or environmental issue. I believe the Philippine eagle is the flagship species in the Philippines that represents the biodiversity of the Philippine archipelago. Anything that we would like to protect in the Philippines, the best species that we can use as a banner is the Philippine eagle. That's why it's called the flagship species. Another important terminology in, um, in the ecosystem concept is the word niche. Niche actually refers to what your role is in the ecosystem and how important your role is. For example, in the class. In the class, there is a class president and, its role, and the class president's role serves as the leader of the class. So any problems or issues that the class needs to address, they refer to the class president who then relays it to the appropriate uh, people that uh, requires its attention. Or let's say if you're the class clown, no, you're fond of cracking jokes in the class, they will always remember you as the class clown or class comedian. Among species of animals or even plants, Different kinds of animals have their own niche. For example, uh, I think one of the best representation that I could give you would be the angry birds. The angry birds were, let's say, the yellow birds inhabit the upper tree region, while the red birds inhabit the middle region of the tree, and the blue birds inhabit the trunk and lower region. So they have their own respective niche in the tree because the yellow bird uh, would not be able to survive in the lower portions of the tree and therefore its niche is on the upper region. And because of this uh, niche, the uh, fundamental niche, it influences how the birds um, is capable or enables it to survive, such as what is shown behind me would be the different beaks. 
the means by which they gather food is what they call the realized niche. They came to evolve no? into different shapes of beak that allows them to capture prey in areas where in, uh, they become specialized for it. Okay, so the, the, the application of the concept of niche could be shown in this picture. And this concept is called resource partitioning wherein the different shape and lengths of the beaks of the bird have allowed them to establish their respective niche along the coastal uh, region or area of the sea. Uh, so for those who have longer necks and longer legs like the flamingos enables them to gather food uh, in the deeper area that makes them domi the dominant uh, species there because the other birds which have shorter beaks would not be able to compete with the, let's say, flamingo in this case. So if the flamingo cannot uh, successfully gather or capture food on the banks of the sea or the seashore, because there is much competition there, it enables itself to survive because it has evolved to become longer, uh, to have a longer neck and a longer legs. And that's why the resource becomes partitioned among the different niche uh, or the different species of birds upon realizing their specific niche in the ecosystem. Okay, ecosystems are controlled both by external abiotic and internal biotic factors. External factors are those that control the overall structure of an ecosystem and the way things work within it, but are not themselves influenced by the ecosystem, while internal factors in the ecosystem not only control ecosystem processes, but are also controlled by them, and consequently they're often subject to feedback loops. <clears throat> okay, so um, what is an example of an external factor? Let's say climate. Let's use climate as an example of an external factor. Climate determines the biome in which the ecosystem is embedded. So let's look at the, the earlier definition. External factor controls the ecosystem, but are not themselves influenced by the ecosystem. And clearly, climate is one. It influences the ecosystem, but is not influenced by the ecosystem. Okay, so malaki ang ano, no, overarching ang impact ng climate sa ecosystem with regards to the size, the relationship between habitat and ecosystem, the collection of habitats and ecosystems, the number of species that is included, and the number of tro trophic levels included. <clears throat> okay, so this table shows the differences or comparisons between the habitat, the community, ecosystem, and biome. So an additional term that is shown here is uh, habitat. Okay, so yung pinakahuli is biome to, no? this is biome, the, the last one. Sorry na, uh, <laughs> I'm covering the screen, but uh, I'll make sure in the next video that I will prepare, it will, I will not be uh, covering it. No? So just did over this in the first column. What is the definition of habitat? It is the natural home of the organism. And in terms of size, it is small compared to the ecosystem. And the habitat lies within an ecosystem, meaning to say an ecosystem can comprise several habitats within itself. Okay. Therefore, a habitat, uh, a collection of habitat would make up an ecosystem. One habitat may contain 
one or two species, while uh, a habitat being smaller than an ecosystem contains only a few trophic levels. The next column would be the community. The community is a group of organisms living in a particular environment with several common characteristics and comprises only biotic factors in a particular environment, comprises only the biotic factors in an ecosystem, changes with the environmental factors in a particular geographic area, and include the collection of plants, animals, and microorganisms in a particular ecosystem. So what is clearly emphasized here is that it is a biotic component of the ecosystem. While the ecosystem, on the other hand, includes everything, both living and non-living things. And in terms of size, it is always larger than a habitat or a community, and one ecosystem could contain many habitats. A collection of ecosystem ultimately makes up a large unit of biomes. One ecosystem can contain a very large number of species, and an ecosystem contains, well, it has to contain all the trophic levels for it to be stable. Okay, so to define the biome, a biome is a large naturally occurring community of flora and fauna occupying a major habitat. And what characterizes a biome is that it shares similar climate condition despite having many ecosystems inside it. It occupies a large geographical area and differ from each other by the different climate conditions that they have. And examples of this would include tropical rainforests, grasslands, deserts, and others. Okay, so this is just a graphic representation of how ecosystems are distributed throughout the world. Uh, and it clearly shows that the aquatic sphere or area of the earth contains uh, a large geographic area of the earth, but uh, with regards to the distribution of ecosystems as well as biomes, there are more biomes in on land. Uh, there are more ecosystems and more biomes on land. There are fewer biomes and ecosystems in the aquatic uh, environment, but nevertheless, the number of species are also uh, well competitive, no, almost at equal terms with the terrestrial species. Okay, formation of biomes um, are influenced are generally influenced by its location on Earth as well as the rotation. You know? Okay. And uh, the equator represents zero degrees. And uh, diba, if we're going to uh, draw a horizontal line across it, this is zero and 30 degrees would be this one. This one. So meaning to say, uh, on the 30 degrees latitude, because horizontal lines along the surface of the Earth represents the latitude, and therefore within the 0 to 30 degrees latitude, you will see the distribution of biomes. Uh, and typically, along the 30 degrees latitude are deserts. And nearest the equator are forests. But the type of forest that, sorry, that predominates this are tropical rainforests, while this one, among a deciduous forest, where the dominant species are the coniferous trees, yung mga pine trees, 
and the polar regions are also referred to as the cold deserts. And actually what influences also the, the temperature is influenced by how the Earth rotates on its axis. Okay, this diagram also shows the different biomes depending, uh, starting from the uh, equator going to the polar regions where the temperature decreases as you go towards the polar region because if this is the sun it would be it is it would be suffice to say that the equatorial region would be the region nearest the sun that would be receiving much of the sunlight and farther from it would be the polar region and thus the type of vegetation is influenced as the temperature changes from the equatorial going to the polar region and thus it divides it into different biomes such as in the equatorial we have rainforest biomes savanna and desert biomes while in the 30 degrees there is the temperate forest temperate grassland and desert and uh, in the subarctic, uh, the taiga, and finally the polar region, the biome there is called the tundra. Now, another lesson. Now, let's proceed to another lesson. And this lesson are what we call ecological pyramids. Okay. Pyramids in nature, uh, examples of them are the pyramids of mass, uh, as shown in the screen. And in the pyramid of mass, the triangle, particularly the base of the triangle, is where much of the mass can be found. Okay. We're talking about mass. No? And if we're talking about the mass of living things, we call it the biomass. So why is it that the triangle uh, is an upright triangle? Because it is very vital that plants outnumber the consumers on the upper level of the pyramid. Otherwise, if this is an inverted triangle wherein the consumers outnumber the producers at the base, soon enough, we will run out of food. Okay, so that is the essence of the pyramid of mass, especially in the terrestrial ecosystem. But surprisingly, you will find an inverted pyramid in an aquatic ecosystem. We're in, uh, if you will look at a, a clean, a pristine lake, you won't see the producers making the, the lake or even the sea green in color. Because if that happens, it will upset. Uh, it will upset the ecosystem in the aquatic ecosystem such that the resulting would be a disastrous phenomenon wherein the upper levels or the upper trophic levels dies from too much vegetation in the water. That's why if you will look, if you will find or if, let's say you're driving in the countryside and you will pass along a lake that's colored green, that is a sign of a, an unhealthy lake because we are not supposed to see too many plants making the water color green and that is an abnormal uh, condition that's why in an aqu aquatic ecosystem the ideal setup is an inverted pyramid wherein the producers are kept to the minimum 
because they are also constantly eaten by the herbivores. That's why they, their population seems to be few. And it is the mass na, in the upper uh, trophic levels are larger or is larger. Okay. Um, another example of an inverted pyramid is the is how parasites parasites tend to dominate the relationship for example the producers herbivores parasites and hyperparasite in terms of the population man we're not talking about the mass no? we're talking about the individual count of the species okay it seems that the parasites outnumber okay uh, but we don't generally see them kasi yung mga hyperparasites are very microscopically small okay a unique shape is a spindle shaped ecosystem wherein the producers are at the base the herbivore somehow outnumbers them and there is another uh, pyramid where in the carnivore somehow uh, would always be characterized as the apex no, in the ecosystem. Okay, another example of a pyramid of number is the amount of energy that is transferred from one trophic level to another. So generally, when we're talking about energy flows or how energy transfers itself from one trophic level to another, it follows what is called the 10% rule. We need to say when we're talking about 10%, whenever energy from one trophic level is transferred to another, only 10% of that energy would be transferred. So we need to say, let's say if the grass, uh, if the combined amount of energy of the grass totals 10,000 kilocalories, the moment it is eaten by the grasshopper, the energy that the grasshopper would benefit from the grass is only 1,000. Okay, why is, what is about the 10,000, 10% rule that is weird? No? Kumbaga, why, why not 100%? Why only 10% energy can be derived? It's because the ecosystem is not really a perfect ecosystem. Much of the energy that we would derive for food will just be liberated as heat, heat of which we do not benefit from. But of course, the combined heat generated by the organisms on Earth allows the Earth to warm itself, making the environment or the Earth or the planet livable. Okay, but uh, the heat itself is something that we don't benefit from. For example, uh, I think one of what the best explanation of the 10% rule is when you pour gasoline in the engine of a car did you know that in let's say one from the 100% energy in the fuel only 10% actually is the one that will make the car move what happens to the 90% of the energy in the fuel it's the one that just makes the engine hot and it just escapes in the surrounding air. Heat. Kaya nga, di ba? When you touch an engine, it's very hot. But it's not something that really made the... It's not a major factor that really made the car move. Because only 10% of the energy in the fuel is the one that actually made the car move. 90% escapes as heat. You need to say, life is not perfect. Much of it, you know, much of the energy in nature is wasted actually. 
Okay, another pyramid uh, clearly shows an increasing pyramid with regards to uh, an inverted pyramid with regards to how chemicals move through nature. A uh, good example is DDT. Uh, I think yung Silent Spring or Rachel Carson story clearly explains the movement of DDT in the environment. Wherein if the DDT is introduced in the water, the amount of DDT actually increases further in each of the trophic level such that uh, the amount at the start is still too small to kill the producers. It is yet still too small to kill the zooplanktons. But as the amount of DDT reaches the upper trophic levels, that is where some large fish begins to die and even the topmost predator becomes the victim of the uh, negative effects or the killing effects of DDT. Such is, such is the inverted pyramid that exhibits the movement of DDT in nature. So in relation to this lesson are two important terminologies, biomagnification and bioaccumulation. When we talk about bioaccumulation, it is the increase in the concentration of a pollutant in an organism. Meaning to say, uh, let's look at this one fish. Meaning to say, a fish accumulates a toxin from the environment and for as long as it does not kill the fish, the toxin begins to build up inside until such time that the fish could no longer tolerate it and the fish dies. So we're talking about a potent toxin and a weak toxin. So which toxin actually has a stronger bioaccumulation potential? A weak toxin or a strong toxin? The chemical with the higher bioaccumulation potential will be the weak one. Because since the toxin is weak, it does not instantly kill the fish and begins to build up inside. Whereas the strong tox a strong toxin, even a small amount eaten by the fish, kills the fish and therefore it no longer accumulates in the body because the fish is already dead. On the other hand, biomagnification is the increase of concentration of a pollutant in a food chain. Meaning to say, uh, if the pollutant eaten by a small fish is still small in quantity, it does not kill the fish, but the fish will be ultimately eaten by a much bigger fish. Of course, it, the, uh, it, this much bigger fish does not thrive on a single small fish. It will have to eat several small fishes in the process. And the toxin builds up as it goes higher into the food chain. And ultimately, all the toxin ends up in the large fish. That is why uh, yung mga, the large fish that are caught in the ocean are those suspected of harboring a large amount of heavy metals. Heavy metals which are toxic to humans. And... Uh, Eating large fish is discouraged among pregnant women because chances are the heavy metals in large fish would, would uh, have an adverse effect in the developing embryo inside a pregnant woman. woman. No, kaya it is highly discouraged for pregnant women to eat large fish. So as I said, which, is, which toxin has a greater potential for bioaccumulation? It is the mild toxin. And it is also the mild toxin that has a strong potential for biomagnification as well. <clears throat> okay. So one good example of a heavy metal and very toxic one is mercury. So when mercury is introduced into the water and finds its way into the food chain of the fish, 
And since the fish is part of the diet of a human, okay, chances are it becomes a health risk for people who would eat that fish. So which, is, which fish is more vulnerable to biomagnification? Is it the small herring or is it the big tuna? Okay, I think you already know the answer that biomagnification is more vulnerable or it's the tuna that is more vulnerable to biomagnification. Why not the herring? Because the herring does not instantly die since the amount of toxin is not yet high enough to kill the herring, but in the tuna, the toxin is already too high and chances are uh, it can be adversely affected. So in conclusion, interactions among the same and other among other species is instrumental in explaining the concept of balance in an ecosystem. No species can survive nor can it exist in its own without a minimum degree of interaction within itself or with other species. So with that, uh, I hope that you have learned something from uh, this lesson or this module of the ecosystem as well as the principle of interconnectedness. And uh, right after, uh, within this week, the enabling assessment for interconnectedness or module 2 will now be activated. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, you may post your questions in Schoolbook, whether it may be in the form of a private message or um, public one, so that uh, your classmates may also uh, benefit from the answers that I will be giving to that particular question. Thank you very much. This is Doc Fonoliera. And uh, goodbye.